1 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. State Board of Education regular meeting of November 15, 2020 is called to order. Marilyn, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? Yes, there are people who have registered to provide public comment. We have uh, two people in person and then we have um, people also online. Um, I will review the rules. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board and I'll keep track of time on the timer here that you can monitor. We will strictly follow the time limits so everyone has an opportunity to speak. It is the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people and disrespecting anyone by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. Uh, public participation will occur in person and virtually and we will have John Love be the first speaker and he will be followed by Bree Mogenberg. Ready when you are, sir. Okay, greetings. Uh, I, I live in Holly, and uh, the Holly school system uh, has uh, tested the, the students. And uh, for 10th grade reading, 75% uh, of the kids were below grade level. And it wasn't just below one grade, but up to three grade levels below. And I've asked them to do something to uh, correct that. And uh, that's one of my concerns is <clears throat> overseeing the uh, uh, oversight responsibility for improving these kinds of performances. Uh, a couple of other things that are concerning is the finances for schools. Uh, we have given uh, Illich $800 million from the school aid fund for the uh, hockey rink, and that's the bonds for the uh, years. So that diversion of money by the legislature and by the governor is uh, counter to what the actual law says. You can't divert school aid money for these kind of projects, but they do it. In addition to that, they didn't even have the number of votes required, two-thirds vote, to give the money away. And Whitmer was in, in the <clears throat> Senate, said that she objected to that, but they went ahead and was done anyway. And I took that to the Supreme Court, but uh, they don't want to enforce the Constitution. They're more important issues than uh, dealing with that. Uh, other thing that bothers me is this uh, uh, charter school system. Uh, when they set up the uh, financing, they said, okay, there's a certain amount given to the school system based on the number of students. Well, it costs more to educate someone in the high school system than it does in the elementary system. So the charter schools have focused on the elementary system, and as a consequence, they've gotten the same amount of money. So there should be a two-tiered system for paying these costs. If you're in an elementary, you get 9,000. If you have a high school students in the count, you get 15,000, because before they could move it around and cover the expenses, of the high school system with the difference between what it costs for a kindergartner. So those are aspects of this that have distorted the quality and the funds that are available <coughs> for teaching schools in uh, Michigan. And uh, the other thing that is concerning is the state constitution establishes this board of education to oversee education because they didn't want politics involved that we had us before. Now it's become this, the governor's here and she isn't, she's absent. She should be here and involved in the education system and do the job that needs to be done. Thank you for your comments. Bree Thank you for your time here. Thank you. Bree Mogenberg's next. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bree Mogenberg. Again, I am here on behalf of Moms for Liberty of Isabella County. This is the fourth month now I've been here. And I'll tell you right now, today's opening deer day. And I would prefer to be sitting in a deer blind, freezing my tush off, 
than I would to be here again to say the same thing that I've said for the last four months. In those four months, I've messaged everybody. There are two people that have responded to me. Nikki, thank you. Tom's not here. Hopefully, he's harvesting a nice deer. Um, and I thank Tom as well. With that said, perseverance is one of my favorite words, and I feel like Jesus has put that on my heart to continue on the topic with the resolution for sexuality and gender content in Michigan public schools. The very first word that is in the state constitution for the duties of this state board of education is leadership. Leadership, what does that mean? Does it take a state board of education to lead this state into parent distress? Is that what we're supposed to be leading on? No, it's not. I would think that we're supposed to lead in education. And just like the gentleman spoke, the numbers and the scores. But instead, we have found in so many of these meetings that time is consumed with sexuality and gender content. Where is it going and where has it gone? If you are not helping to solve the problem, if you are not looking into a resolution to bring clarity to all of this and parent alerts, you're part of the problem. You are part of the problem. And when I am called and my friends are called provocateurs because we're speaking up for our rights, which part of that does it take to be a provocateur? Because we have morals and morality that we want to stick to. If you are going to be on this board, shouldn't you be leading the morality of this state in public education? I feel as though DEI has become a trendy excuse to literally exclude morality. Why and for what purpose? So I'm going to ask you again, the resolution concerning sexuality and gender content, please look at that. If you are not looking at it, you're going to continue to hear from parents. They're not going to stop. This is very concerning. And not once has my organization asked you to remove books. We have asked you to make it known that parents should be alerted in regards to this content. And then all of our problems on this can be resolved. So again, if you are not helping to solve the problem, you are in fact part of the problem. I am asking you to step up and take a leadership role and help do something about this. I would love to hear from somebody. No offense, Nikki, I think you're great. Other than Nikki and Tom. If you don't try to find resolution with people that have different views, what are we doing? How is this benefiting our kids? Let's benefit our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have heard from the people that registered to speak here in the room, and we will now move to virtual public comment. Mike, can you let the first speaker in the room? Um, there are no speakers waiting for public comment. Okay, there are no speakers waiting for public comment. It is 1.10, which is the posted time for public comment. So I will declare that public comment is closed at 1.10 with all the people that are registered and on the line, uh, no one in this instance, um, having had an opportunity to speak. So thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, board members, we are going to continue with our agenda from this morning. The next item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is presentation on graduation rate increase guidance documents. This presentation will feature information on the graduation rate increase guidance scheduled to be released later this week. We will share ways to support high school students in graduation success and highlight research-based strategies that improve graduation rates. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. We welcome our presenter, Dr. Delsa Chapman, Deputy Superintendent in the Division of Educator, Student, and School Supports. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Dr. Chapman, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and good afternoon, board. Today's presentation shares the graduation rate increase guidance document that, yes, will be released in just a few days. The contents of the presentation will include acknowledgments, the overall purpose of the guide, and we will share four broad strategies that we believe through research and collaboration will move us into providing guidance that will definitely raise the graduation rates across Michigan. And then we will share next steps. Acknowledgments. 
The Michigan Department of Education's first graduation rate guidance document was a cross-division effort between the Division of Educator, Student, and School Supports and the Division of P20 Systems and Student Transitions. We would like to acknowledge the input of staff from both divisions regarding this effort. Additionally, thank you to the Michigan Association of School Administrators and the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals with a very special thanks to Tom Livesey, Superintendent of Oak Ridge Public Schools, and Hiam El Condre, Principal of Fortson High School of Dearborn Public Schools for their thoughtful feedback and overall analysis of the document. And now for the purpose of the guidance. The Michigan Department of Education graduation rate increase guidance document serves as a resource to encourage and support intentional efforts of intermediate school districts, our ISDs, and local education agencies, our LEAs, both traditional public school districts and public school academies, in partnership with educational organizations in identifying ways to support high school students in graduation success as we emerge from the pandemic. This guidance also highlights research-based strategies that will improve overall graduation rates. This effort supports Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan goal five, which is here presented on the screen, increase the percentage of all students who graduate from high school. So taking a look at the national efforts, as we move into this discussion, it is important to note that the nation has been committed to reaching a 90% graduation rate equitably for nearly 20 years. Authored by Civic and the Everyone Graduate Center at the John Hopkins University School of Education and released annually in partnership with the Alliance for Excellent Education and America's Promise Alliance, the document that you see here presented on the screen is the Building a Grad Nation Report, which examines state-level progress and challenges toward reaching the Grad Nation campaign goal of a national graduation rate of 90% for all students. This report highlights policy recommendations to assist in reaching its campaign, and it is this report that helped us here at MDE to provide the upcoming guidance. The national landscape on graduation rate increase is similar to Michigan. The national effort to reach a 90% graduation rate by the class of 2020 peaked in 2019 at 85.8%, an all-time high and an increase from 79% nationally in 2011. Similarly, Michigan has seen a steady increase in our four-year cohort graduation rates during eight of the past 10 years, between 2011 and 2021, moving from 74.3% in 2011 to 80.5% in 2021. Over those years, with the exception of 2015-16 and 2021 academic years, we also can note the following. There was a presentation to the State Board of Education in March of 2022, which highlighted the following for students in Michigan. African American and Hispanic Latino students showed double digit increases from academic year 2010 through 2020-21. Cohorts designated as fifth and sixth year showed significant increases in the number of students graduating during the pandemic. And finally, our economically disadvantaged students in the class of 2021 had a slight decline in the final graduation rate. And now, what are the specifics that we will provide in our graduation rate increase document? We intend to share and highlight with you today four broad graduation rate increase strategies. As we emerge from the COVID-19 pan pandemic, it is imperative that we go well beyond academic recovery to reignite students' interest in and connection to school and continue the steady upward graduation trend for Michigan students. 
to assist local education agencies, intermediate school districts, and public schools academies in these efforts, the high-level strategies delineated in the graduation rate guidance, again, soon to be released later this week, will now be presented in the next <laughs> few slides. Strategy number one, absenteeism intervention. We will share and highlight two today, and you'll notice on the slide that the two primary resources are underscored, which represents that they are linked. These two resources are actually linked in the graduation guidance. In some of the detail or high-level overview I will provide for you at this time. As it relates to EWIMS or the State Early Warning Interventions Monitoring System, please know that it is a data-driven decision-making process that helps educators systematically identify students who are showing signs that they are at risk of dropping out of school. It examines the underlying causes of that risk and matches students' needs to interventions. It monitors their student progress and the success of the interventions that are chosen by the local school district. Fundamentally, EWIMS is an ongoing cycle of examining data and making decisions about supports and interventions to help students succeed. The Michigan Department of Education initiative is a cross-division effort cross-office effort that has produced a comprehensive EWIMS implementation guide, as well as EDUPATHS, a professional learning module set for our educators across the state of Michigan that helps them to implement and truly understand the advantage of utilizing EWIMS and its seven-step process. Our second resource that we would like to highlight under the absenteeism intervention strategy is Preventing Dropout in Secondary Schools. This is an educator's practice guide provided through the Institute of Education Sciences and the renowned What Works Clearinghouse. It provides educators and, admi and administrators with four evidence-based recommendations for improving high school graduation rates, as you see noted here on the screen. And very quickly, we would just like to highlight of those four recommendations, you'll see that it is specific to monitoring progress, providing intensive, intentional, individualized support to our students who have fallen behind, to engage students by offering an array of curricular programs that connect schoolwork with college and career success meaning that we not only want our students to be college and career ready, but opportunity ready as well. And finally, through absentee intervention, we would ask LEAs to make sure that they are creating small, personalized communities to support groups of students that are at risk. Our second strategy, academic enrichment and tutorial support. This very critical element of the graduation success process we are sharing today, its importance is to intervene early to ensure that these students have the academic supports necessary before they fall behind. As educators, we know that research-based academic enrichment delivers the best results when it is individualized and provided consistently. As an example, for our tier three intensive intervention students, this tutoring should be either daily or at minimum three times per week for at least 30 to 60 minutes. Additionally, students deserve access to an adult credentialed in the subject area content for which the support is being provided. It is also essential for the academic interventionist or tutor to have prior experience in tutoring or be willing to participate in a district or school-based training program, which is highlighted and emphasized in the guidance document as we encourage LEAs to implement very structured academic enrichment and tutorial support. When these guidelines are met, the educational entity has committed to what research has deemed to be high-impact tutoring according to the National Student Support Accelerator. Further review 
um, will provide will provide through a study high impact high impact tutoring state of the research and priorities for future learning. A few strategies that we're asking LEAs to consider when creating these supportive measures. The first off is flexible learning opportunities or options. These will depend obviously on a student's location within the state and the programming in, available in their school or region. But as mentioned this morning as Dr. Rice presented, um, in the update with our strategic education plan goals, these opportunities should and could include dual enrollment, CTE or career and technical education, alternative education measures, testing out, advanced placement or AP courses, international baccalaureate or IB diploma programs, early middle colleges, and much, much more. Accelerated learning is the second of four academic enrichment and tutorial support resources or strategies that we are asking LEAs to consider. Accelerated learning helps students who are behind in school to catch up by strategically preparing them for success in the current grade level content. Acceleration requires teachers to identify crucial content that they need to teach and that students need to learn so that students can access current grade level material and continue on to progress. By extension, it also requires teachers to identify and forego less foundational material. Personal curriculum, or what we call or refer to as PC, is a tool for modifying the Michigan Merit curriculum to individualize the rigor and relevance of the state graduation requirements. All students across the state are eligible for a personal curriculum or PC with different populations of students falling under different rules for modification. The exact alignment to Michigan Merit curriculum and what can and should be modified is determined by the LEA itself. High impact tutoring, as stated earlier, this particular resource, it is actually a study which shares the state of research and priorities for future learning from the National Student Support Accelerator. It highlights the program's characteristics and conditions that evidence suggests make for a very effective tutoring program and to create an evidence-based framework for delivering and evaluating very key in this process, tutoring interventions. And now moving on to the third broad strategy, extracurricular engagement. The opportunity to be engaged in organized activities beyond the regular school day can be a true benefit to students, especially once they reach high school. According to the research, the benefits include a balance between home and school commitments, social skill building and teamwork, a sense of belonging within the school community, which then helps to lead the student into increased academic achievement. Additional notes in regards to extracurricular engagement include the following. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, limited the ability for students to participate in extracurricular activities, we believe that now is a great opportunity to re-engage them rather than enrage them due to the variance and difference that they experienced in education during the pandemic. When students do not have access to extracurricular activities that excite and engage them in their earlier years, it may be harder for them to develop a sense of belonging which can lead to disengagement and unfortunately sometimes literally dropping out. It is very important for the high school to offer a variety of opportunities that appeal to their students' varying interests. These include, but definitely is not limited to, athletics, school clubs, problem project and place-based or 3P learning opportunities, student leadership opportunities such as student governments, class officer positions, and or comprehensive school, out-of-school time learning programs. 
The key to having truly engaging extracurricular activities is to provide relevant student voice and choice, hands-on exper experiential learning opportunities that reflect student and community culture. Additional resources, as you see here on the screen, around extracurricular engagement include our Summer Learning Toolkit, Michigan After School Partnership. The toolkit provides best practices and resources to develop, promote, and sustain high quality summer learning programs in Michigan. We highlight and emphasize this because we want students, students to have a continuous opportunity to be engaged in extracurricular programs outside of the regular school day. And secondly, Michigan's out of school time standards of quality, the fourth edition, after school and summer learning programs. We refer to this as most, as it is the Michigan out of school time standards of quality, which are designed to assist schools and other organizations in developing high quality, comprehensive, out of school time programs for all children and youth in grades K-12. The standards are based on research containing, I'm sorry, concerning quality programs for school-aged children and youth. And now, moving into broad strategy number four, a very, very important strategy, mentoring. The key component around this strategy is the building of relationships. According to the 2013 Role of Risk, Mentoring Experiences and Outcomes for Youth with Varying Risk Profiles Report, the relationships between youth and assigned mentors are key to the overall benefits of the experience itself. Youth involved in mentoring rated relationship quality, according to the 2013 report, as the most significant element of their experience. The three areas that they highlighted most are, number one, closeness with the mentor, two, the extent to which the relationship included opportunities for learning and working towards goals, and three, the extent to which the mentor considered the youth's interests and input. And so, with that in mind, Mentoring when successful, as we see here shared on the screen, it, develop, it's, it is successful when it develops a strong mentor-mentee relationship built on trust and a mutual commitment to consistent scheduled interaction and support, as well as the next two points, providing differentiation with that support and includes collaborative, meaning between the mentor and the mentee, goal setting, that helps the student to look towards future opportunities. Additionally, strategies that are embedded in the guidance document, which you see as links here. The first one is check and connect. This is an evidence-based dropout prevention strategy that relies on developing relationships with students to support and maintain school performance, mentoring, and other supports. As shared earlier and very similar to EWIMS, the check and connect strategy supports students' progress through early identification of barriers, proactive interventions, and intensive and individualized supports. The second highlighted resource as it relates to mentoring, the elements of effective practice for mentoring, details research-informed and practitioner-approved standards for creating and sustaining quality youth mentoring programs and con consequently impactful mentoring relationships. This sixth evidence-based standards document is intended to be applicable across almost every type of youth mentoring program. Each standard includes benchmarks to ensure the safety and effectiveness of mentoring relationships, as well as enhancements that may be promising, innovative, and useful for local, local programs. Additionally, a program planning and management section of this resource offers recommendations for designing, building, and strengthening 
mentoring programs and services for our LEAs and the students they serve. And now, based on those four broad strategies, we would like to share next steps. At the state level, MDE is committed to monitoring aggreg aggregate progress for Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan goal five by taking a very close look at the research and outcomes of the data. We also will curate research-based state and national strategies within the My Strategy Bank for districts to include in their Michigan Integrated Continuous Improvement Process or MyKIP plans and the My EWIMS application process. And third, produce additional documents containing strategies, tips, and tools for increasing elementary and middle school student engagement to prepare them for high school, which then would lead to producing higher graduation rates. As we know that students begin to disengage in, in learning as early as their elementary years. Through this guidance, we ask the following for our local next steps. MDE encourages local education agencies to use the graduation rate guidance document as a starting point to explore and implement strategies. Secondly, we ask that they use the Michigan Continuous Improvement Process or MICIP to develop local plans that emphasize on increasing graduation rate by assessing the needs of students, being very selective with strategies, and developing an overall implementation plan. We also would ask that through MICIP, the funding, monitoring, and evaluation of their graduation rate plan be directly aligned to how it provides intentional support to high school students. And finally, we would like to highlight that local opportunity definitely includes the sharing of local practices with evidence of success. So the elements and the strategies that many of our districts are using now should be shared amongst themselves and across the state by way of submission to our Promising Practices Exchange, which is a public facing repository that encourages the educational community to share practices that demonstrate improved outcomes for learners specific to Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan goals. The MDE is currently actively seeking promising practices that support goal five, increasing the number of students that graduate through de December of 2022. That does not mean that we will um, Stop taking those. Additional practices are welcomed beyond December. However, we are being very intentional this month and through the end of December in asking our LEAs to share what they believe has helped them to provide focus on promoting and activities that definitely has the opportunity to raise graduation rates with all of our students across the state. I would like to say thank you again to um, Dr. Scott Kinnicek, who is not with us today, for the contributions from the division that he leads, and also to our educational organizations and the staff here at MDE that put a lot of time in thinking about what should go into the document. We're very excited that it will be released later this week, and I'm hoping that, that the board and Dr. Rice and staff will also be very happy with the outcome that we're putting forward to our field. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Having seen the uh, guidance document, I can tell you that I think it will be a contribution to the field and more importantly to children. Thank you very much. Board comments or questions? Dr. Albridge. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a question that's going to sound kind of like a ridiculous question, no. but I also know that when you change definitions, you change numbers. Um, when we're talking about graduation rates, are we focused solely on one credential, which is the diploma, and or are there other things that go into a graduation rate? 
So that's an excellent question. So we look at how the graduation rate is calculated in terms of what is required through ESSA. So there's a calculation rate, and that is done according to um, what our accountability system involves and includes, and that is handled through our Office of Educational Assessment and Accountability. So when you ask how that graduation rate is calculated, it's not that the, the LEA itself is calculating that, that is embedded within our accountability process, and so those data are determined in a very formula-specific way. It's a federal definition. Everybody calculates it the same way across the country. It is only associated with diplomas. Okay. That, can you just answer my second question, which was going to be, is it apples to apples nationally? It or? is apples okay. to apples. All right. Thank you. Other questions? President Albrecht, it's two for the price of one Tuesday. Other questions? I'm good, thank you. Okay, Ms. Lipton. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, on slide number nine, um, I just want to make sure I understand. When you talk about accelerated learning, um, is that a technique, is that a term of art or a technique used for catching up students? Because when I first saw accelerated learning, I'm thinking about the student that wants to move ahead, you know, within, within a grade cohort. But when I'm reading this, it sounds to me like it's a way of, within the, the grade cohort, of, of sort of catch. Am I getting that right? That's yes, you are, Ms. Lipton. Okay, so it's, it's almost like a remediation type strategy? It's not, it? no, it's not remediation because as we were in the pandemic, we started to look at how do we continue to support our students without remediation? Remediation often stifles the learning process through acceleration. You take the student where they are and you're continuing to move them forward in their current level of grade content and you're providing and supplementing with extra supports. Okay, so it's accelerated within their, within their trajectory of learning. Yes. Okay, thank you. That, that um, then just one other question on slide 11, um, when you're talking about mentoring. So, I mean, I'm familiar with a lot of the mentoring, community mentoring that's taking place in our Promise Zone communities um, to either help students <coughs> get to college or to keep them successful while they're in college. Um, how, and that's basically utilizing community that screened community volunteers. I'm not familiar with this type of in-school mentoring. So could you just describe to me just in general what that looks like? Is this like a teacher-student relationship that's being developed? Or is this the mentors, is it peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, like an older student to a younger student? Or is it all of the above? It could be a combination of, of, of everything you just shared. And so, each LEA will be able to determine what is going to be the most impactful. There are certain communities that have built upon peer-to-peer. -peer. Others would more so want to lean on having a program where in which there are teachers who are then trained. And, though it, and if it's peer-to-peer, -peer, there would be a training component as well with oversight from credentialed adult educators that would be able to support that peer-to-peer -peer relationship. So it just depends on the, the needs assessed by that particular LEA or community, what's going to be a best fit scenario. However, as we prepare the document, we saw that through research, it is strongly suggested that successful mentoring programs definitely include a measure of educators that are credentialed or those credentialed edu educators we definitely aligned and contribute to the mentoring program of a particular LEA system. Okay, so just a follow-up. So the, so the credentialed individual might be responsible for training the community volunteers. In other words, my understanding is that, that mentoring programs are best when, even when teachers are being utilized, they, 
they wear a different hat than the teacher-student relationship. That a mentor-mentee mm -hmm. relationship is different. So even when a teacher is acting as a mentor, they're literally acting differently than when they're a teacher in the classroom, if that makes sense. It does. Okay. Yes. Thank it you. does, and it's true. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you have anything to follow up on with respect to mentoring with Ms. Lipton? Okay. Dr. Pugh and then uh, Dr. Pritchett. I haven't formulated a question, so. Dr. Pritchett. <laughs> Thank you. On slide 10, where you talk about extracurricular engagement, and the research is pretty clear on if we can get students engaged, if they're struggling academically anyways, but if they're engaged in the school environment, then we're apt to see more success. However, my prior experience tells me that there's always the but if you don't have a GPA of 2.5, I'm making that up right now, you can't be part of this athletic team or this particular club or et cetera, et cetera. So I would assume then some of these strategies would have to intertwine. So if I'm a student and I want to be part of the volleyball team, but I'm struggling academically, so my grades just aren't right there, that possibly I can do that. I'm making all this up right now while I'm talking. Um, but I'm also going to have a mentor um, who's going to help me along the way to keep my mind on my studies along with my mind on my volleyball. Is, is that kind of the big picture of some of these strategies? Correct. So the, the four broad strategies, we're asking for LEAs to consider them as a package, if you will. So you may have a student that has had a problem with absenteeism. We're going to focus on that first, but that st same student would benefit from mentoring and being um, plugged into or reined into extracurricular activities through engagement. So yes, they will build upon and lean on one another for success. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Just a note that with respect to graduation, with respect to GPA and ability to participate in sport, there's an MHSAA standard. We heard that articulated by Mark Ewell, the executive director of MHSAA, uh, a month or two ago. It's sort of a floor standard. Right to which local school districts, and I think that's to what, what, what you were what you were citing to, local school districts can embellish sure. upon, upon that and take that, have to pass at least four or five classes, the MHSAA floor standard, and increase that. And what that ends up doing is inadvertently walling children off from what's most important to them. So on the one hand, you want to encourage their, their, their stronger academics, on the other hand, walling them off of the one thing that's getting them to school is not necessarily the way to do it. And I think that's what you were referencing. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think Dr. Chapman's experience is similar to mine, his experience is similar to a lot of educators, that you want to work with the child to raise his or her academics. You don't want to necessarily, um, um, again, wall them off from the, the extracurriculars. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, who's next? Ms. Snyder? No. Uh, Dr. Pugh? No, I'm good. Ms. Tilly? Cannot give it away. <laughs> okay. Um, Dr. Chapman, I think the, um, the guidance document is going to be a, a tremendous contribution. I think as we emerge from the pandemic, we have to lean into the tutoring that our governor has referenced that, that has been funded in part by the state legislature, and I anticipate will be funded more by the state legislature. Local school districts have substantial funding right now to uh, do high quality tutoring and as more community members feel comfortable coming into schools, as more schools feel comfortable welcoming people coming into schools as tutors, as mentors, a lot of these natural supports, the tutoring, the mentoring, the absentee intervention and the extracurriculars are going to are going to reflourish, yes. and I think we're going to see it in our in our outcomes. Thank you for for the presentation and for the guidance. Thank you for the opportunity. You bet, uh, board you. board members. It is uh, 1:46 p.m. Uh, the next item.
on our agenda is the approval of early childhood standards of quality for birth to kindergarten. Standards of quality for birth to kindergarten were presented to the State Board of Education on August 9, 2022. Since that time, public comment has been solicited and incorporated into the early learning and program standards that are presented for board approval. These standards would replace Michigan's current early childhood standards of quality for infant and toddler programs and early childhood standards of quality for pre-kindergarten, both of which were adopted by this board in 2013. The board is being asked to approve the standards during today's meeting. We welcome our presenter, Mr. Richard Lauer, director of the Office of Preschool and Out-of-School Time Learning, uh, who does an outstanding job in his work in the department on behalf of young people. There will be a PowerPoint presentation, and again, there will be a vote after the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Mr. Lauer, to you. Welcome. Thank you for your time. Thank you, board members. So today, just a reminder that the work that has been done over the last about 16 months by stakeholders um, from around the state vested in this uh, body of work is in support of uh, top 10 strategic education plan goals one, two, and three in particular. Um, just to remind you again, the purposes uh, of these standards are threefold to not only support the growth and development of all children, so you know, emphasizing all throughout the state, birth through kindergarten, but also to um, guide and support early childhood professionals, recognizing that um, children vary in their development tra developmental trajectories across this age band. So individual developmental trajectories and expressions of learning uh, will be respected across birth through age five in these standards. Um, these standards are also to help guide programs uh, at that level, not just at the child level, toward the highest quality in their operations and to give guidance on what that looks like. Uh, so to be able to accomplish this, this will be done through being able to provide coaching and professional learning to administrators, to teachers, to child care providers, uh, to paraprofessionals, to associate teachers, to home visitors, to uh, a myriad of professionals across the birth through eight, uh, kindergarten uh, continuum who care for our youngest citizens of Michigan, as well as obviously a guide for early child professionals themselves for their own um, uh, knowledge and um, ability to continue their career advancement. Um, uh, uh, as they so choose. And also, we um, support the use of these standards that are before you to inform higher education programs to advance their work in promoting the next class of professionals in the state as well. What you have uh, before you are the same categories that were before you before related to uh, on the left side of the screen. Uh, these are the child level early ch learning and development standards and the categories uh, that went before the public. And on the right hand side are the, uh, uh, the program level, the, uh, the environmental or the system level uh, standards that the children are in the environments and that we really strive to increase the quality of. So getting to, uh, to what we learned over the last month or so, who participated in public comment? And the counties represented, I thought this would be important for you to see visually uh, that we extended across the bridge, importantly to the UP, um, as well as across the uh, upper portion of the Lower Peninsula in a good um, representation across the Lower Peninsula as a whole. We were able to um, achieve 80 plus uh, comments over the 30 days, and I'll get to the detail of that in just a moment. What I felt was most important to um, point out here is that we received the most comments from parents, parents or guardians um, in the public comment period followed by the early childhood program directors and administrators of our school districts as well as coaches and consultants and then the private sector 
early childhood teachers and caregivers. I wanted to point out at the bottom, community members is the broad category uh, that is the private citizens of Michigan that do not fall in the above uh, categories that are early childhood um, system providers, caregivers, educators, as, or identify within the K-12 system as more traditional roles. So that's what community member re references. I felt it was important to also acknowledge the fact that um, many of our public comments uh, came from individuals who reflected um, associations with these professional organizations, whether they're at the state or national level. So our final tally um, was 88 total comments over a period of 30 days. Um, I did, uh, my team and I, looked at the, out of the 88 comments, five uh, individuals indicated they did not read the document at all, and, but they commented. Um, one used the uh, survey to comment on another early childhood guidance document that was produced out of my office and it wasn't relevant to the document before them. So backing those six out, we got A2 valid, as I indicate, public comments related to the document that was out for public comment. You see uh, 61 or 74% were positive in agreement that the early childhood standards of quality for birth to kindergarten would improve the outcomes of young children, um, and obviously 26% on the opposing side of that. Um, would I like to acknowledge that of the 21, only 11 provided written comments as to why. And um, the board will, did or will receive a detailed, um, did. did receive the detailed um, file related to the comments. So just in terms of being uh, transparent, the uh, process for public comment, uh, we put it out for 30 days, uh, widely communicated through the department's communications, uh, as well as through the Office of Great Start, Early Childhood um, Communications, Facebook, social media, listservs. Um, we extended it through the writing committee of 72 individuals, networks, both through the Institutes of Higher Ed, through um, professional associations, many of which I showcased earlier, et cetera. Uh, the comments that came back went back to a subgroup of the writing committee of 30 some members. Um, it was uh, then discussed, reviewed, um, even on the side of those who opposed, the, some of those critiques were valid and we recognized those and utilized some in the revisions. The revised draft that was uh, posted not, uh, and provided to you. So you had a draft changes version as well as a clean version. Both versions are both on the website uh, as well so that you can, the public can tell the, draft, uh, the track changes version of where all the changes were made and the clean version. I did provide for the board in this presentation a couple slides of the public comment that were from a variety of different roles um, of public comment individuals and that support the standards. As a whole, um, after public comment, these additional uh, edits were made. Uh, alignment of the goals of the standards uh, were aligned explicitly to heads, the National Head Start and National Association for the Education of Young children professional standards. Um, the, uh, they were previously, I mean, they were aligned, but they were explicitly linked uh, in, the new, in the actual document. And the same is going for the uh, document that you guys previously uh, approved in, I believe it was 19 and 20 for the uh, uh, standards for preparation of teachers for early childhood, general and special education, birth to kindergarten, as well as the pre-K three. You can read uh, the rest of these on the screen. It was important for the field not to use the, the, the zero, for, but term it birth through eight months for clarity. 
and their um, very specific uh, indicators that they felt were important to um, adjust for clarity. Ultimately, these changes um, resulted in a variety of additional uh, formatting, clarity, supports. Um, we're in the process of um, preparing, pending your vote today um, and your position to finalize these documents in a um, uh, user-friendly um, version for posting online. Ultimately, we will produce for the first time, we've never had resources until this current period, to produce an online professional learning module for these standards, um, and then produce a series of resource documents. Uh, you can see the topics. Obviously, one will be on the actual um, standards themselves because we did substantially switch them from two separate documents on infant, toddler, and pre-K to a comprehensive aligned birth through kindergarten uh, document. And so we want, felt an overview was in, in, in need here. And then the other four resource documents um, pull from the standards and each one of those documents then uh, highlights the importance of these different periods or topics. Infant, toddler, pre-K, successful transitions across this uh, period of birth to K, and also the importance of high quality family partnerships during this period. And each one of these cross references back to the appropriate standards within the document. That's what I have for you today. That is more than enough given the <laughs> voluminous uh, standards that you um, and your team across the state prepared, including uh, both below the bridge and on the other side of the uh, bridge. Could I have a motion to approve the standards as presented? Uh, we have a motion from Dr. Pugh. Could I have a second? Second from Dr. Pritchett. Is there any discussion of uh, Mr. Lauer's presentation or the standards as presented? I would just say thank you for uh, all the work that you guys have done on this. I know it's been a, a long track and, and a lot of people put a lot of hard work and effort into this and how much I appreciate, I said it before, but I'll say it again, how much I appreciate the fact that this is very play-based in nature and, um, you know, to me that's, we were getting a little away from that direction and I'm glad to see we're swinging back. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Albrecht, other, other comments? Ms. Lipton. Um, just, a, a, just a clarification question. Um, would this be something that, for example, like a licensed daycare provider might look to? And then if someone was looking at this resource online, um, is there sort of like online support from your, from your office in terms of how best they can use it, um, because I think it's wonderful that it's that it's available online. But sometimes people need um, some additional sort of verbal coaching in terms of you know how to best put it in practice. Um, so is that something that you envision or have available? So what you see on the screen for the additional supports, the online training module is a self-paced training module for the field. Um, this is phase one in my vision. Uh, phase two will be to produce more in-depth within the different areas, of, uh, diving deeper into the standards by domain and producing additional self-paced training modules for the providers for the field. Um, that's part two of the vision. I wanted to get something out the door sooner for this year. As it relates to uh, the private providers, we have a mixed delivery system. Obviously, state pre-K, GSRP providers, um, we set legislature and the department uh, together, we have our, our requirements. So we do require our coaches to be trained in these standards um, and as well as our early childhood administrators. They coach our teachers in the standards. And so that's our requirement private child care providers, they are not required, but 
if they want to uh, achieve higher quality um, along the Great Start to Quality tiered rating system and receive higher subsidy rates if they're taking subsidy children, then they need to engage in greater professional development and they might choose to get additional training related to these standards to achieve that as one example. So um, the systems are interconnected in terms of pushing quality um, standards related to quality uh, provide uh, quality systems of provision of childcare as well as state pre-K. And so the Great Start Quality System for all early care and education from birth through kindergarten, actually birth through age 12, so zero to age 12 for childcare is interconnected here with our GSRP as well as the Head Start community. Thank you very much, Ms. Lipton, uh, Mr. Lauer. Other uh, questions, comments, concerns? Going once, <clears throat> twice, thrice, looking around. Give it away. Um, seeing no other comments or questions, uh, Mertz, if we could have a roll call vote. Lipton? Yes. McMillan, absent. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Snyder? No. Tilly? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much, board. We're at 203. We're in the approval of State Board of Education minutes. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of October 11th, 2022? Moved. Moved by President Albrich. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Lipton. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. Mertz, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Lipton? Yes. McMillan, absent. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. Board, we are at the report of the president. President Albrich. I'm happy to say for the first time today, we are literally ahead of schedule <laughs> <laughs> by two whole minutes. Um, very briefly, uh, I want to congratulate Pam Pugh and Mitchell Robinson uh, on their re-election and election to the State Board of Education, respectively, um, and also to extend my gratitude uh, and, and on behalf of the board as well as myself to anyone who put their name on the ballot this year. It is not an easy thing to do. As we all know, um, it takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of... Um, uh, it takes away from your family time, and we just really appreciate people who are willing to step up and to put themselves out, like, out there like that. I attended the NASB annual conference with Tiffany Tilly and Judy Pritchett a couple weeks ago. Um, I want to, again, extend my appreciation to the board for nominating me to receive a Distinguished Service Award. It truly was an honor, and I got to be on stage with both Tiffany and Judy as they presented the award, so thank you to them. Um, I will say the award had, uh, it was very pretty and it had a very nice sharp edge to it, which made for a really interesting uh, experience at the airport. <laughs> uh, let's just say my luggage was gone through. <laughs> um, they did, however, give it back to me and let me get on the plane. Okay. So I, I'm happy to report that. Um, I may be stealing a little bit of Judy's thunder here, but I want to congratulate Tiffany, who was nominated to serve on NASB's uh, nomination committee, uh, which is really exciting. So she will help uh, select some future leaders for NASB. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention that I took part in a video panel with um, NASB with the CEO, uh, Paulo Di Maria, as well as a couple additional um, board leaders from other states. And we were talking about leadership and governance, and um, the, the, the crust of this uh, conversation will appear in the next edition of the standard, which comes out by NASB. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, President Albrich. Um, report of the state superintendent will be uh, brief <clears throat> and will be almost exclusively in pictures. So enjoy, enjoy a mini tour.
That big kid is Leah Porter, by the way. <laughs> that is a rap video. I was not the featured presenter. <laughs> New student. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. So, um, so, so just two um, two quick stories um, from a, a recent trip to the the Western UP. The first is we went into Brighting Township, and, and their uh, mascot is the Flivers. And I defy you to find another school on Earth um, that, whose mascot is the Flivers. It's pretty extraordinary. And um, they live their Flivver uh, nickname. It's, it's quite extraordinary. The band was there, and, uh, and they do it up. And they've got this Flivver vehicle, um, a Ford vehicle, if I recall correctly. Um, in you know tucked into the corner of their their high school when you when you enter so that's that's one thought the other thought is that we were in um, uh, Karen Carefoot and I were in a uh, a district up north and we were um, looking at um, I beg your pardon Mark Howe and I were were in the Western UP looking at um, uh, CTE programs. And this young man explained the difference between aquaponics and hydroponics. Who knew uh, that there was any difference between waterponics and waterponics? Uh, but there is. And I've got uh, this young man on video explaining these two. And he is all about it. And at some point, I'm going to play these mini videos for, for the State Board. They're very impressive. And they make for quite an endorsement of career and technical education. This kid was really excited about the ability to grow um, in two very, very similar ways, but, but also distinct ways as, as well without the need for an enormous amount of, of soil. Nutrients, yes, soil, um, no, it was quite fascinating to, um, to see. Thank you very much for that little mini pictorial tour uh, with congratulations to Dr. Pugh and Dr. Robinson on their um, uh, re-election and election to the state board. Um, appreciation to President Albrecht for her NASB award. Um, and appreciation to board member Tilly for her election to the nominating committee. I did not want to be that guy who went from getting us behind in the first place <laughs> to re-getting us behind. Board is 210. The report of the Teacher of the Year, Ms. Nanette Hansen, the 2022-2023 Michigan Teacher of the Year, will present her report. Ms. Hansen is first grade teacher at Lemmer Elementary School in Escanaba Area Public Schools, where the superintendent is a very fluent French speaker. Ms. Hansen is joined by Ms. Dawn Perez, Region 4 Teacher of the Year, who teaches at Swan Valley High School in the Swan Valley School District in Saginaw. She's a high school career and technical educator who focuses on business administration, management and operations, and finance and financial management services. We welcome Ms. Hansen and Ms. Perez to the board table. Presenters, welcome. Thank you. It's always great to be here with the board and to share things that are important to teachers and students and to education as well. 
And again, I'd like to reintroduce Don Perez from Swan Valley High School. We're going to talk today about the importance of CTE uh, and CTE teachers. Go ahead. Thank you, Jeanette. Hello, good afternoon to all. Um, I am Don Perez, and I've been teaching for 32 years at Swan Valley School District. I am here to share you with two of my passions. Um, they are my family. I have been married for 34 years to my husband, Gilbert. I have three children, Vanessa, Nicholas, and Marcos, that are all alumni of Swan Valley High School. I have seven grandbabies that are under nine years old. Um, as of March 2023, I will be a nana of nine grandbabies under 10 years old. And my grandbabies' names are there. So that's my first passion. Um, I love teaching because um, students... Oops, I'm clicking too here. Students need these skills to be successful in their futures. I love teaching real life applications that students are able to include in their portfolio. I love teaching students how to get certified in Microsoft Office applications. I love numbers, computers, and problem solving. Um, now on to my second passion and that is career technical education with an acronym of CTE. Our future in career technical education is a must at the high school level. Not everyone goes into college. These kids need these skills at the high school level. CTE in high school where it is free for kids to learn and explore. Kids need to have the time and opportunity to explore in high school the different programs that are available. I'm going to tell you about my youngest son Mark's experience in ninth grade. He went to a K-8 school. And during his ninth grade year, they created a ninth grade at the Career Center where he received his core classes and at the Saginaw Career Center and every six weeks, he was able to participate in six programs at the center. He participated in nursing, culinary, law enforcement, welding, design, and child care. My youngest son had the best experience to figure out early on what he wanted to go into for free. This boosted his confidence and encouraged him to learn life skills. The program was cut due to staffing issues. Why is CTE important? CTE provides students with not only career and academic skills, but soft skills that are needed for the modern workplace, such as critical thinking, communication, teamwork, citizenship, integrity, and ethical um, leadership, research tools, creativity, and innovation. Our program has had Business Professionals of America Club, BPA, for the past 20 years. We have had many successes, as you look at the board, where students have leadership, service, resume builders, and scholarship opportunities. These opportunities are awesome for students that are not going to college or they want to go to college. I want our Michigan students to have the opportunity to experience these life skills in high school. The skills they learn are valuable and makes our Michigan students employable and marketable and stand out over other students. Here's an example of a career and technical education program. This picture is of my classroom and you'll see the makerspace there with the green board on it. Our testing center is there too. This houses our business, administration, management, and operations, we call BMA, and finance programs. A few common examples of our CT, other CT program areas that are offered around Michigan are science and engineering, information and technology, architectural and design, culinary, health and social services, education and child development, hospitality and tourism, and our fine performing arts. Here's just the areas that we offer at our school at this time. These are the programs. I'm not going to read them. Oops, went back too far. It's just going a little slower, technology, you guys. There we go. Um, our students in our BMA program will certify nationally in the main four that you see on top there. That's PowerPoint, Word, Excel, Access. They volunteer to take the expert levels. They are able to compete in the workforce for a level up on an entry level position. How my students validate their skills. Other than oral and written communication skills and project management, Microsoft Office is the third most requested skill for jobs. The students are able to build their resume and have an actual certificate to put in their portfolio. Why is CTE? 
high school better than other college for some students. Technical schools tend to offer more hands-on learning and require fewer unnecessary classes than four-year colleges. Technical schools prepare you for the workforce in a less time frame. CTE is one-fifth of the high school enrollment for concentrators. Career and technical education, CTE, bridges the gap between high school and post-secondary plans. CTE programs include career skills, training, that helps students become ready for college or work. CTE curriculum focuses students on academic, employability, and technical skills used in a specific occupation. Our CTE students have skills and are able to go directly into the workforce and or to college with articulation credits. Currently, our students at Swan Valley High School may earn nine credits from our programs at Delta College and or Davenport University. Oops. Why is there a teacher shortage? Available colleges have decreased for CTE specific areas. Not enough students going into the teaching to cover the future retirees. Pay is a concern for education students. We need to have a plan to retain our education students here in Michigan. I have learned this summer that education students will get their loans forgiven if they are in Michigan for a certain amount of time. That is a starting point. We need to add something that after that, that time to retain our good teachers from moving on. We have a teacher shortage because Michigan colleges have decreased for CTE specific areas. <coughs> there are not enough students going into teaching to cover the future retirees and pay as a concern for education students. <coughs> Sorry. This past week, I went to a Michigan Business Education Association conference, MBEA. They confirmed my research for only having three colleges that you are able to get certified, CTE. The colleges are Eastern, Western, and Ferris State <coughs> University. They commented that, they, that there were no student teachers this at this time. This is sad to me. Sorry, just take no drink. problem. I will. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Let's break some of the barriers of preventing CTE at the high school level. We need to attract teachers, engage high school students, hiring career changers, more CTE vocational teachers, raising the importance of teachers to retain who we have. We need to prepare teachers, holding teachers by keeping them competent, attainability of student achievement. We need to support teachers providing mentors, providing constructive free feedback, training and development decreases a teacher's desire to leave. My personal experience in our local area with the administrator cuts and decreasing of programs is, first, St. Charles High School since 2020 no longer offers business computers. They laid their teacher of seven years off. Second, Bay Aronet Career Center and Saginaw Career Complex no longer have a BMA program since their teacher retired and from my personal experience this past year. Our Swan Valley IT teacher retired this past year and we did not replace him and lost two of our programs. Our school was on a cost of living pay freeze for almost 10 years. The beginning pay for a teacher in our area is 34,000 to 38,000 a year. Most education students have gone to school for four and a half to five years and have debt and could work at Applebee's making more than a beginning pay teacher. Our IT specialized CT education students are going to go to the workforce beginning at fifty to 60000 a year to start before working as a teacher. We need to make CTE as important as our core area, our AP classes, and our special education in our Michigan schools. CTE should not be the first program that an administrator looks at to cut. It is sad to me that an administrator has to make decisions on what is best for students due to dollars. I know we have Perkins funding for our CTE programs. I'm the one that had the energy to apply for our programs 24 years ago on my own time. I wanted to take a, have a good program. I wanted CTE programs run by competent CTE teachers. Help us make CTE as important as core, AP classes, use the dollars to keep our programs intact with highly qualified teachers. We need to do this by inspiring students while they are young. Number two, we need to mo uh, have more CTE cadet teacher programs in the state of Michigan to help with our shortage. Number three, increase beginning teacher pay. Lastly, four, we need to make sure the dollars that were approved this summer are getting into the CTE programs to retain teachers and programs. I am very grateful that our budget has increased this year at our district. I know the governor passed this $10 million budget 
And I want to make sure that you know the critical importance, not only for some kids, but for all kids will benefit from these skills. Keep us, pay us, all kids deserve to have these opportunities. Thank you for your time and consideration in keeping CTE at the high school level. Now I'm going to turn this over to Nanette. Thanks, Don. Oh, now I went too far. <laughs> I go back. Just the arrows, yep. Oh, weak. Uh, because I'm an elementary, first grade elementary teacher, I'm not exposed to the CTE program every day. I'm, you know, getting down and dirty on the floor with my first graders. <laughs> but so I had to really look into and go around and find out what, you know, CT really is all about. So I went to visit two very different ISDs, and I can tell you that I was blown away by what I saw. I can tell you it is not the same old voc ed that I remember, and I'm old and I have gray hair, so don't look too close, of when I was in school. The stigma is fading. The stigma is fading. And what I saw there, I, I felt like there was more respect an interest for CTE, career and tech education. And I saw that students participated in career and technical education programs that they would leave high school both career and college ready, whatever path they decided to go on. So I started right out here in Ingham County at the Wilson Talent Center with um, Joe Wenzel, and he sh allowed me to come in and kind of shadow him for the day, and I got to meet his innovative staff and talk with some of his really engaged students. And you guys talked about this this morning, and Dr. Rice talked about this this morning, but I am telling you, these kids were so into what they were learning. And I saw kids working in cosmetology, culinary arts, and I, I talked to a, a young man who was about 17 or 18 in the insurance program, and they were getting ready to take their um, certifications in the industry on property and liability, personal insurance, and commercial ins insurance. And they were taking a pre-licensing exam. This, to me, was a huge deal. These kids are 17, 18, and 19. And when they got out, they would have all of these licenses. And they would be able to start their program in their career right, right out of high school for free. And I think not only that's amazing for kids, but for parents. And pa I'm a parent. I have two in, in college downstate. It's a lot of money. And so, I mean, I didn't know these, these opportunities were available. I feel like I'm sort of educated. I feel like we need to do a better job really recruiting and, and, and highlighting to parents about the opportunities for free for their students and take that stigma back and, and allow all kids to have this opportunity to get these skills. It was just, it was phenomenal. Um, the, you know, the energy in that building was palpable. From, and the students knew why they were there. So, you know, sometimes you, you'll go into a school and, you, and you'll ask kids how they're, eh, you know, they're not really engaged as much as you would want them to. These people wanted to be there. They knew how these opportunities were going to benefit them in their life after high school. For free. For free. <laughs> That's the important thing. Um, so then after I left there, I went into my own local ISD in Escanaba, Michigan, the DSISD. And again, I, was, um, I had the opportunity to be exposed to innovative staff and students who were so into what they were learning. Um, they offer early middle college, articulated credits, concurrent learning opportunities. They had 12 paid placement opportunities with eight programs. But the thing that was the most amazing to me uh, that I could not believe I did not know is that our kids in the UP, Escanaba, Michigan, are taking part in the NASA Hunch program. Familiar with this program? Well, I wasn't. The Hunch mission is to empower and inspire students through a project-based learning program where high school students learn 21st century skills and have the opportunity to launch their careers through the participation in the design and fabrication of real-world valued products for NASA. For NASA. I was blown away. And I'm going to go back here, hopefully if I can. Nope, I went forward. Oops. 
So right here on this first screen, if you'll look to the right of the screen, the boy holding that object, the girl, the girl holding the object in the middle. That is the locker door system for specimens that are collected at the space station for NASA. And two of the three that were submitted by this DSISD were accepted. The last one that was accepted, the kids all got to sign, it's in space. That's phenomenal. I mean, why are we not, you know, yelling this from the rooftop? I don't know. But I think all parents and kids should know that these opportunities are available. Even with all these incredible opportunities, there are still many challenges, many of which we touched on this morning. I'd, yeah, we need to get back on track. Mm -hmm. One more, right there. Um, we're going to talk, I'm going to show you just some of the logistics for the UP. The vast amount of geography that we have to cover in the UP is a barrier for our students. Lack of feeder programs resulting in sort of one-room models where kids, all kids are not getting the skills that uh, other kids are getting. Uh, the absence of an EDP, um, Educational Development Plan, being used with fidelity from the beginning of their journey in school all the way to the end so that they can follow this career path. It's not being, they're not seeing it being utilized with fidelity. Um, and they need more qualified instructional aids. Well, what happens, if you take a look at this, um, this is Delta Schoolcraft, which is the ISD that I visited. Take a look and play, pay close attention to the amount of roads that are on this Google map. Not very many roads, but a lot, a lot of geography. And so, and this was touched on again this morning, the sheer amount of geography that we have to cover in the UP often leaves a lot of our schools as islands. He spoke of them as deserts this morning. We, but they have no feeder school, and they have no opportunity to get the skills that other kids in Michigan, even in the UP, are, are getting. Kearney NATO schools, Stevenson schools, and Menominee schools, they get no money because they are so far away from their core ISD, they can't get there, the time constraints for the bus or, or, or you know, the logistics of getting their regular classes and their ISD classes in, it just doesn't work for them. So there's no equity and access for some of those kids. And so as we're looking at funding streams and, and access and equity, um, I want to show you the Lower Peninsula here's Shiawassee County, take a look at all of the roads that they have available for them. So they have a lot more opportunities and, and access than the kids in the UP. So when we're thinking about some of that money that um, is allocated from the governor, we really want to make sure that we're paying attention to what's going on up north. Because I would like to make sure that all kids have the opportunity to access these wonderful skills and go on to whatever path that it takes them on, but that they would at, at least have the opportunity to get some of these skills to further themselves beyond high school. Um, and that is really all. And here's my update uh, for some of the places that I uh, visited, as you saw, Wilson Talent Center blown away. The uh, Delta Schoolcraft ISD, which they had the NASA Hunch program, which was amazing. And I went to, over to Holt Public Schools and I visited with former Michigan Teacher of the Year, Leah, and I was spent the day with her. And I spent the day with her special ed, new brand new special ed teachers. And, and I um, was able to kind of see how things are going for the new teachers in her building and see how she was doing, and um, and that's it. That was it. Any questions? Thank you very much for our teacher leaders. I'm following okay. up actually by text on one of the things that you just said, Ms. Hansen. Um, board members, any questions or comments for our teacher leaders? All right. Just, yeah. uh, just, just to note that I think, I'm sorry, does someone? 
Yes, please. It, it was me. Um, one of the questions that I that I failed to ask um, earlier, and I think we touched upon it, but I don't know that um, if it was answered outright and to um, you all's presentation, how are different, what's the disparities or what is the comparison? Do we know any as around teachers being able, um, or schools funding uh, teacher pay increases? Could you please rephrase that question? <laughs> Are, are are we seeing large and huge differences as it relates to um, pay increases for educators across the state? We we do not track pay increases. We do have some some information on pay, but not necessarily pay increases. Um, it is true that different districts have received more funding during the pandemic. Some of that is federal pandemic relief funding. Some of it is state recurring funding. So the ability to provide increases is differential across the state. Um, I will tell you that we've encouraged local school districts not to use, to use recurring dollars for recurring expenditures, non-recurring dollars, for non-recurring expenditures, do not use federal pandemic relief funding for recurring salary increases. It's one thing to do so uh, for a bonus or a stipend of one sort or another, but do not put recurring costs on a non-recurring revenue source. A number of us are concerned that when those federal pandemic relief dollars uh, come to a conclusion, September 30th, 2024, you can no longer uh, use those dollars, that there will be districts that are uh, challenged relative to their ongoing costs. Uh, we think that, um, again, you want to do um, some sort of non-recurring compensation out of those um, in small measure, that's fine. Your recurring compensation for the teacher salary schedule should be out of state funding, state and local dollars, dollars that are going to continue, dollars that teachers can count on and support staff can count count on continue, on a continual basis. And it, it would just be interesting, I mean, just listening to the presentation to hear like what are some of the constraints, because some of the constraints that I've heard have been just reluctance of the people who, who are in the control to do those pay increasing increases choosing not to. I have heard that. I mean, I don't know. And of course, those are local decisions, as you've said very clearly, but it would be interesting to, to hear. And then, like I said, given the presentation, with some of the struggles that we're still seeing with educators feeling that they're receiving adequate pay, and especially in a time where we're trying to make sure we're getting uh, folks into the pipeline, um, as well as retaining uh, educators, um, I would it would be interesting to see and hear what's going on around the state. Um, I, I've heard, obviously, some districts who are compensating their existing teachers um, and trying to use dollars to make sure that they're making up for losses in the past and then hearing the opposite of, of that as well. So, and, and thank you all for, for the presentation and that came across loud and clear. So thank you. I think I think um, school districts are uh, cautious. They want to make sure that they don't over uh, overextend themselves. At the same time, many districts are well aware that if they don't fund their um, their educators better, <coughs> they're going to lose their educators either to other school districts or to fields outside of education. And that's just the reality of it. Um, as people uh, get older, um, they retire who's going to replace them. As young people make decisions about what they're going to continue to do with their careers, uh, there's a competition. Uh, I wish we had more certified teachers who wanted to teach. We have plenty of certified teachers in the state. When we went to write them in Welcome Back Proud Michigan Educator, we found that we had a large number of certified teachers. What we don't have is a large number of people that want to teach mm -hmm. in the profession. Okay. And with the skinny numbers that want to teach, 
we now have not a buyer's market, but a seller's market. And I would argue that it's not good for, uh, for anyone. It's not good for uh, people in the profession. It's not good for people who are trying to hire for the profession. The other thing that I would say is, is that if we're going to expand our CTE programs, we're going to have to expand our CTE teachers because in many cases we don't have the requisite CTE teachers in the, um, in the state. So it's easy for, for us to you know, provide exhortations around the embellishment of the growth of CTE programs. I'm all about that. You heard that almost in a filibuster this morning. But we've got to, alter, you know, rubber hits road in classrooms, and people have to be able to teach the, um, and, it, and it can't be, you know, Mikey from the curb. It's got to be somebody who can teach. CTE is so hands-on in most cases, not all, but in most cases, and you've got to have people that are practitioners. Um, kids can see through the baloney. They can see whether you've actually done this work or not. Um, I'm in a lot of uh, CTE program classrooms, and I'm struck by you have, you have people getting in there, and they're, they're fixing cars with children. They're programming uh, computers with children. They're, they're uh, engaging in particular law enforcement scenarios with children, and, and, and. And kids can feel that experience, and that's exciting to them, and it gives them a sense that, you know, maybe they could be that person. Again, you have to have people who want to be a part of that. In many cases, when people choose to work in CTE, you've worked 32 years in the profession. You know, in a, in a, you're not precisely born and raised in the profession, but you're raised in the profession. Uh, but the same is not true for many CTE teachers, right? They're, they're often mid-career changers. You know, I work in industry for 20 years, and I pivot. Well, when I pivot, um, okay, maybe I don't make the same amount of money, but I have to make enough money to feed my family. I have to make enough money so that my, my standard of living does, doesn't completely plummet. And that's what we hear a lot from these people. They were, they were able to make it work in certain cases. In other cases, not, not so much. So there's a lot to addressing these, you know, choose your, your favorite term, the, the CTE islands, the CTE deserts. But one way or the other, these, these, these areas that don't fully serve our young people. The other thing I'm struck by is, Wherever you go in the state, children deserve these rich experiences. I don't care if they grow up with, with 20 kids in their graduating class or, or 1,500 kids in their graduating class. None of that really matters. They deserve these rich experiences. They're our kids. We've got to figure out how to provide them. They'll look different in certain communities. For example, you know, the one community to which you referred, it doesn't have a millage. So, um, for, and he yeah. said, you know, because the way the lines are drawn for the county, yeah. you know, uh, that is, you know, you would have to sort of do gerrymandering so that these little islands could get some money to, to do things. And so, you know, I don't know the answer to that because that's way beyond my scope. But I just wanted to bring light to the fact that some of these little islands are out there and these kids really could benefit from some of these fantastic opportunities. I agree. And I, I would just say, wherever particular kids are in the state, we need to serve them. If they have special needs, we need to serve them. If they're English learners, we need to serve them. If they're poor, we need to serve them. And if they're in CTE deserts or islands, we need to serve them. And I don't think it, I, I think we get precious when we start talking about, well, you know, your millage um, is, is smaller or you don't have a millage. It's true. But, but that obscures the fact that we will never have a millage in a particular community or communities. There's just not the requisite tax base to afford it. So you can talk all you want about, you, you know, you just need to, you, you know, to, to ante up. Yeah. Right. But, but the, the vast majority of communities that fund millages, fund mill, the AV is typically not in the residences. It's in the businesses. And um, so... So you don't have the business, you don't have the, the assessed value, you don't have the assessed value, you don't have the millage. You don't have the millage, you don't have the resources to get it done. So I just think that at some point the state has to come in um, and, and begin to fill in these gaps. And you see this already happening. What SFRC recommended in January of 2018 was fund based on need. Don't fund based on head, fund based on need. And that extends 
not simply to poor children, English learners, students with disabilities, but also children in remote corners of the state who, whose transportation costs more or that have limited to no uh, CTE. Um, and so, so I think it's all of, of a piece of what do we want for Michigan kids? Do we want them to fend for themselves based on where they're born or raised? Not a chance. And and you've you, you know you've um, um, you, you've you've well said it. It's the first time, Ms. Hanson, that I've known a first grade teacher to advocate for CTE at this table. <laughs> that and, is and I would like to say I did talk to Li at the Wilson um, Center. Lin Lindy um, is on the the. Um, let me let me look at it. She's on the Michigan. Oh, come to me. Um, anyway, they're making pathways. To start the career, you know, in early preschool, kindergarten, the career paths, they're, they're, they're working on it. They're hoping that it's going to come out in 23. And I, I, you know, that will be part of how I can be part of CTE and, and get kids access, here it is, Michigan Career Development Model, mm -hmm. and how that kids can get access to finding what they love in first grade and kindergarten and all of that. So, you have to, anyway. you, what we want to do is to broaden their awareness yes. early. Yes. Um, let them explore later and let them develop skills For free. Uh, still later. In high school. Free. Well, well or, or earlier than, than that, mm -hmm. broad opportunities to be aware, explore, and then ultimately develop without tracking kids, <laughs> without tracking children. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate your, your presentation. You so we appreciate you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. It's 2.43 p.m. Next item on today's agenda is state and federal legislative update. And uh, back by popular demand is uh, Mr. Marty Ackley, the director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs, um, followed by... Um, one imagines a, a very brief report from our chairwoman, Ms. Lipton, and uh, the, the uh, ever-extensive report from Dr. Pritchett. Thank you very much. Ms. Hanson, when I was in elementary school, I wanted to be a priest. I don't know if there's a CTE program for that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, the legislature has been on, uh, on a break for a better part of a month um, campaigning. Uh, there was a big shift in Lansing and the legislature as a result of the election. Um, the House and Senate both um, flipped the majority from Senate from a Republican to Democrat, uh, but the margins are still slim. Um, currently the, in the House um, this year, this session, it was 55-53 Republican. Next session it will be 56-54 Democrat, so it's a difference of two votes or two seats. And then in the Senate, um, it went from 22-16 Republican now and next session it will be 20 to 18. So um, even though there's a there's a majority uh, switch, there's still a slim margin. Um, so they have to take those into consideration whenever they bring up legislation and, and do voting. Um, the leadership obviously has changed also. Senator Winnie Brinks from Grand Rapids is the new Senate Majority Leader. Um, the Senate Republican Leader will be Senator Eric uh, Nesbitt. And in the House, the new um, Speaker of the House will be Representative Joe Tate. He's the first African-American um, Speaker of the House. And then the Republican uh, Majority Leader in the House will be a Representative Matt Hall of Marshall. Um, and we're, there's speculation of what the lame duck will be like. Uh, we're expecting a pretty quiet lame duck, but who knows? Um, so that's my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Rice. Exactly as, uh, as advertised. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Lipton? Thank you, Dr. Rice. Uh, because of scheduling um, conflicts, we were not able to have a legislative committee meeting. Um, in advance of this meeting, our next legislative committee meeting, I believe, is on September the 1st. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. And Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Dr. Ulbrich uh, indicated in her report, um, Tiffany and Cassandra and I were able to attend the NASB uh, national Convention. Um, it was, I thought, very well run. Um, I, it was good to see colleagues from across the country, and in particular from Alaska, 
and from Guam. Mm -hmm. I think the Guam delegation was uh, one of the largest and the friendliest as far as um, um, very <laughs> outgoing and um, uh, everybody was uh, very friendly. Um, I think the main thing that uh, you come away with, uh, as you do any time you get together with people from other states, et cetera, is that we all have the same um, challenges. Uh, we all talked about the same issues that we were dealing with as state boards, even though there is a wide variety of ways in which state boards are appointed or elected or operate even uh, in the different states. So that's always interesting to uh, share those also. But uh, a couple of good sessions. One of the sessions uh, was led by Michigan, uh, by staff here uh, at MDE, uh, about the Welcome Back program and was well received. They got lots of questions, so that was um, good for us to be able to sit in on that and support that. And um, I know Tiffany probably in her remarks will talk about her visit to um, uh, a um, elementary school, so I'm not going to speak to that one at all. Congratulations again to Cassandra on receiving the Distinguished Service Award. It was indeed an honor and a pleasure to uh, stand on the stage with her and Tiffany uh, and uh, present her with that award. And congratulations to Tiffany, who was voted unanimously to be on the nominating com committee for NASB as they nominate individuals to um, in leadership roles. So um, all in all, a, uh, a good um, uh, use of uh, time and uh, learned a lot and came back with lots of new ideas. So that's it. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Uh, board, we are at comments by State Board of Education members. Who would, who would care to share? Ms. Tilly, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to echo the sentiments of saying congratulations on your award. Um, you have done many years of service in the state, and I remember years ago some of your service that you were doing. And I don't, I don't even think we had a conversation about that, but um, thank you so much for your service to our state. You. I want to say congratulations to Pam thank also. You. I'm so happy to have you representing us at this table tonight, <laughs> and to have um, Ms. Robinson, who will join you. Um, NASB was a good conference, good experience. Um, we had some great conversations, and uh, Wildflower, I, I really like to go to the schools when I go to NASB. I think it's a good experience to see what people are doing in other states and what works well for them. And um, again, I think the literacy component of um, having multiple, um, having multiple groups for readers is, is so important. And as they, um, they actually make sure, they, they see where the child is. So once the child is done with that group, they move up to the next group. Um, so there's opportunities for growth. And having those parapros, a, a teacher can't necessarily do it all by themselves in the class. They need that support in the classroom. Um, and, and the parapros sitting there working with the children and interacting with them, you could tell it really helps. And, and they seem to feel really comfortable with the parapros that were working. So I think that's a great model um, that we need to implement in more classrooms here. I know some, some classrooms do it, but we need to make sure we're teaching children where they're at, not just their age. So thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Other board members? Uh, Dr. Pugh. Um, I, too, will just echo everyone and congratulate Cassandra, congratulate um, Tiffany. Um, and what very well deserved. Um, I am very excited um, and know that I am blessed to be able to continue to serve um, on this board um, and with my colleagues here. As I mentioned before, um, as I traveled across the state, it was really good to be able to lift up the work of the department, um, the work of you, 
uh, Dr. Rice um, and, and the staff and really talk about some of the efforts that are underway, um, our top 10 goals that we have, and people really being eager to hear about um, what it is that we're planning to do to tackle the issues that we all know that we have. And so this morning, um, starting off the, the meeting with um, just evidence that we are really in tuned and uh, wanting to know more about what is going on across the state for all children. Um, and not that everything is perfect, we know that it's not, um, but that we are in tune. Um, so that, that does mean a lot, but really just it says a lot too that we have a department that is concerned about diversity, that is concerned about and promoting equitable funding, safety and health in schools. Um, just really says a lot. So I was really blessed to be able to speak to the work that is underway here, as well as um, the board um, and the work that we do and how we work together um, for the most part to make sure that we're um, preparing all children for the best future possible. Um, it was exciting to be at the press event and for it to be right around the corner from my house at the <laughs> ISD mm -hmm. where I used to spend quite a bit of my time um, but to really hear the announcement about the first uh, teacher apprenticeship that was taking place um, that will start in Saginaw. That was exciting, and so thank you for that invite. Also, last week, I had the opportunity to speak uh, before, I think it was like 300 students, and it was at Henry Ford College, and it was the Black Male and Queens Focus Group. So that was quite exciting. Um, and, and exciting work that they have going on there and really t speaking to um, engaging students in, um, in community college and speaking to the opportunities there. And um, I don't know if, if many of you know, but I received my associate's degree before um, going on to um, a four-year degree out, out of state and then being able to come back and, and finish up at the best university um, there is in <laughs> Michigan. No, I better not say that. <laughs> but anyway, I better wrap it up. So uh, uh, good to be here um, and good to be able to be here in January as well. So that's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. We, um, we had some technical difficulties right about the time you said that. <laughs> But maybe you'll uh, be able to re yeah, re yeah. repeat that next month. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe you won't be able to repeat that next month. We'll see. Um, thank you so much. Congratulations. Uh, Ms. Lipton. Thank you, Dr. Rice. I would like to uh, join my colleagues in, congr in congratulating Dr. Albrecht for the NASBE um, uh, Achievement Award and also to extend my congratulations to Dr. Pugh and Dr. Robinson on their uh, re-election and election to um, this body, and also to Ms. Tilly um, for the leadership role of NASB. Um, I had the uh, great opportunity to travel to Mount Pleasant and attend the Michigan College Access Network mm -hmm. Conference um, last week where I was um, very humbled to receive the Michigan Promise Zone Association Promise Keeper Award for work with Promise Zones. Um, but more importantly, I was able to really immerse myself again in the work that the Michigan College Access Network is doing and really working um, with a lot of players in the state, including this body as well as the department, to um, work toward goal number six, which is increasing the percentage of adults with a post-secondary credential. <coughs> Um, I would urge all of uh, you to um, really um, get immersed in the excellent work that they're doing. Um, I hope that they will be able to come and present to this body um, because <coughs> the philosophy, I think, is really in keeping with how we can um, both create a college-going culture um, in our state, um, in addition to bringing along those that um, were not able for whatever reason to uh, attend college or receive a post-secondary credential. So they're really coming at it from both ends. Um, and really, the um, I think what was really exciting was the uh, their vision for this particular conference and what we hope to carry into the future is 
really doubling down on the concept of 60 by 30, which is a very bold goal. Um, there are There's one county in the state that has achieved that, um, but the, the remaining counties in the state really do um, need to work toward um, sort of busting past that high 40 percentage and moving into the 50s and then um, hopefully into uh, the 60 by 30, which isn't just a goal for the sake of meeting a goal, but what we know based on research is that states that are economically thriving, um, what they all share is a population with a college attainment level that um, surpasses the, the mid to high 40s, which is where we are in Michigan. So, um, so again, um, I just applaud the work of the Michigan College Access Network and I hope that we can continue to um, work with them in achieving all of our goals, but, but certainly goal number six. Thank you. Thank you for clicking. Hey, congratulations. I had no idea you received that award. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have mentioned it. Right? Yeah. Um, but very well deserved. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, other, uh, Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Um, I'd like to offer my congratulations to Dr. Pugh on her re-election and uh, welcome Dr. Robinson when he gets here in January to the board on his election. I look forward to working with the uh, board next year. Um, as I said, what I came away from, probably the main thing from NASB was we all have lots of challenges ahead of us, most importantly, our students do. And so um, we need to be ready to work through those challenges together, support our local school districts, in particular support our teachers in those classrooms every day because they indeed, um, along with our parents and our students, will make a difference. I am jealous, Dr. Rice, that you've been able to get into some classrooms. Um, <laughs> I have been able to get to a couple of plays and lots of swim meets. Um, and a couple of football halftime shows. So um, I am interested in trying to um, make arrangements to uh, get into classrooms again to visit good. the students and staff. There you go. So. That's a good thing. I'm looking forward to uh, going out to some schools with you. That's a good thing. After the calendar year begins. Um, any other um, reflections from board members? Yes, ma'am. I just want to quickly say thank you to Judy and to for the support. It is, one of you mentioned earlier about putting your name out there. Mm -hmm. It is never easy, mm -hmm. and so I definitely appreciate the support that I received. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Anything else for the good of the group? Ms. Snyder, anything for the good of the group? Oh, thank you. Okay, very good. Board members, uh, our future meetings are December 13th, January 10th, February 14th, all at 9.30 a.m., all regular meetings. If there are any topics board members would like included in future meeting agendas, please notify Marilyn or me. Please note that the time is 